Hi, I'm Patty. Hi, I'm Kristen. And, and this, this is, is the Service, Service Design, Design Show. Show. I'm Mark Fontaine and this is the Service Design Show. With the Service Design Show we help you to stay one step ahead by talking to the people that are actually shaping the service design field. My guests in this episode are Patty Hunt and Kristen Lowe. They are the co-organizers of a service design conference in Hong Kong that will take place in September this year. And they've done projects throughout the whole Asia including China, Vietnam and Indonesia. For the next 30 minutes or so we'll be talking about topics like how is service design in Asia different from the rest of the world, about artificially intelligent services and about the lack of urgency for companies to adopt service design practices. If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide in the description or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. Welcome to the show, uh, Patty and Kristen. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Awesome uh, to have you uh, here. This is the a debut because we haven't had two guests on the show simultaneously yet. <laughs> well, we hope it works out. <laughs> well, well, we'll see. Um, uh, let's just start off by uh, saying you just told me that you're organizing a conference in Hong Kong about service design. Tell us more. That's right. Uh, yeah, we, we thought the time was right to uh, actually um, have a conference dedicated to service design. Uh, I'm not sure if people will know too much about the region, but um, it's not as much of a known, a well-known concept here in Hong Kong and in the region. So we kind of thought we might not want to be too early with this, so we sort of sat sat on it for a couple of years and then uh, this year we felt the timing was right to actually say, you know, let's let's have the conference. Um, so yeah, yeah we're, it's, a, it's at the end of September. Uh, end of September, okay. At, at end of September and it's a two-day conference and we've got a couple of uh, familiar faces who I'm sure <laughs> that you've, uh, you've interviewed before, including Mark Stickton and Adam St. Lawrence. And Lauren Curry, yeah, um, right, yeah, uh, and we're really excited to have have them come over for it. Actually, it's yeah. a bit of a coup for us, and lots of local, uh, lots of local practitioners, and lots of um, uh, local, really interesting case studies. Actually, we've got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, if you want to get your, your finger on the pulse of what's happening in service design in this part of the world, then this will be the the place to come. Yeah. Wow, cool. And uh, where can people find more info about this conference? Thanks for the uh, thanks for the lead <laughs> in. There. Um, they can find uh, we've got actually a Facebook page and also a website. So the website's just www.servicedesign.com.hk. And All right. uh, yeah, and there's uh, by the time this there'll be super early birds or early bird tickets still on sale. I think. By the time we, yeah, by the time this is out, so yeah. All right, we'll put a link up there because it sounds really interesting. Will be, uh, will the videos or presentations be online after the conference, or is that still unclear? Mm. Yeah, they will be. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> I just made it. We'll, we'll we'll see after September. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, Patty and uh, uh, Kristen. You're not from Asia, uh, or at least not from Kong, uh, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious, what was your first encounter with service design in general? Yep. Uh, uh, you, you go. Okay, well, yeah, look, <laughs> I, uh, my, my first encounter with service design was actually through the Global Service Jams, courtesy of Adam and, and all of his work there with that as well. I, uh, I, I actually uh, even thought that Jam was involved the first time that I showed up to a service jam. I knew so little about service design. so. From there, I've kind of, uh, you know, that's what's gotten us to meet each other as well. And that's what's gotten us started in our own businesses and got me into service design as well. So that was a super formative moment, <laughs> definitely. And for me, it was around uh, probably about 10 years ago um, when I was, uh, when I first sort of started in this area, which was in user experience design. There were two people at the company I was working at. Uh, um, working for at the time and they were Suze Ingram and Megan Hayes and they mentioned to me service design and I thought oh that's interesting so I kind of just attached myself to them 
pretty much for the entire time I was at uh, at this company and, and learnt as much as I could about it because I was just quite fascinated at, about its relationship with UX. <laughs> and now you're still here. <laughs> and now we're still Explo here. Yeah, I Exploring see. new new boundaries. Exactly. Yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> All right. Um, You've seen a few episodes already, and I hope a lot of people that are watching also have seen or listened to a few episodes. But let's explain the format briefly for the people who haven't seen it yet. So what, what we'll do is I have three topics that you uh, uh, pointed me to, uh, printed here on a stack of papers, and you also have a stack of papers, right? Okay, can you hold them up? Yep. And your stack is uh, are called the question starters. What we'll do is I'll pick one of the, my topics and you'll pick one of the question starters and you'll have to answer your own question. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. So let's just uh, let's just uh, dive right in and um, right. Let, let's just start off with this one uh, right away and it's called service design in Asia. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Can, can you pick a question starter that goes along with that one? We can. Let's do. I'm going to, do, I'm going to ask you this one. I'm going to mm -hmm. go with uh, how much. So, Patty, how much service design is there in Asia? <laughs> hmm. Okay. So, I don't think there's as much service design in Asia as there is in the rest of the world, as we were chatting about earlier. Um, I think that it is when it starts. I think it's gathering momentum and I think it's getting a lot of momentum now and I think it's really about to get a lot of service design in Asia um, and I think because of the sheer scale and of like places like China I think once it starts you will see it absolutely leapfrog probably a lot mm. of the other um, hubs of where where service design is more well known um, purely because it's it's a different context and it's a different uh, a, a different situation here. So um, I think, well, I would say there's not so much right now. I think that there is about to be quite a lot in the next few years. What needs to happen for the leapfrog? Um, I think that just because um, it... It, like I'm, I'm just talking about China in particular. Like there is such a different business dynamic there. Uh, it's fiercely competitive. Uh, it's uh, interestingly innovative in a way that probably we wouldn't necessarily recognise as Western people as innovative. But it's innovative in its own way, and it absolutely that that coupled with that you know, highly competitive context and that willingness to try and experiment and get things out really fast, I think that will accelerate innovation to a point where it will actually, like, experiments will be done and forgotten about at a far greater rate than mm. pot potentially we've seen before. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. have, you seen, have you seen any uh, big differences between the services you have practice in the rest of the world compared to Asia? Yeah, I, do you mind if I? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think um, the, the, the big thing for me here is that the, the the difference that I see in the opportunities for service design locally versus outside of Asia is that when I look at Europe, the US, and Australia, I think that service design tends to, to these are largely functional economies. They they work. The power's on. You drink the water out of the tap, it's not going to kill you. Um, so everything you do in service design is usually about delight. It's a layer on top of something that works and about making it even better again. What we have here in Asia is we have economies that are in the in the midst of shifting from being mostly product-based to being mostly service-based, and they're getting a lot wrong in that process. Mm -hmm. So you have this thing pop up that I call service seizure which is where a service just doesn't work, like, at all. You know, you almost have to call a lawyer just to terminate your, you know, your pay TV contract and things like that. You <laughs> just right. literally yeah. don't even use some of these services. So I think that's the opportunity here is just literally doing functional, really operationally focused service design because these services have to work. Because here the bar is so, so low that, you know, if it takes me three weeks to change my address with a local bank, then that bank isn't going to get disrupted by Bitcoin or anything else. They're just going to get disrupted by a bank that can do that in two weeks mm. or one week. Mm. And that's not a particularly low barrier for someone to jump over. So I think competition will kind of play that out a lot. 
Mm. And, and what is um, um, what is holding back service design right now in Asia? Why, why is it still lagging behind? Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a quite a few factors at play. Um, I think one of uh, the major factors is the education system here is quite different in that uh, it's the focus is very much on fact, you know, sort of factual learning and um, what do you what do you sort of call that? The yeah, it's like retention of, yeah. of data rather than thinking critically about yeah. right. prompts. Yeah, there's sort of more like it, it, yeah, it's not so much critical thinking, um, but there are, there are changes being made now. Like there's a lot of people working in this space to sort of. Uh, bring that layer, but because design, you know, service design as a discipline does require sort of, you know, a challenging kind of mindset, uh, mm -hmm. which traditionally, it's all generally speaking, but, um, you know, for instance, Chinese uh, uh, kids going through the education system, they're not really taught to challenge, they're, they're really just taught to, it's a very hierarchical thing. The teacher knows, you just learn what you're supposed to know and repeat back. So yeah. uh, I think that needs to change quite a lot more before you get that sort of real design mindset going. Um, and I think what else is at play? But, but is there, the, 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 that will take a generation. So I can imagine that the first drive of service design will be coming from a company uh, style. Instead of people that are that have graduated from a university, I can imagine companies just want to accelerate this and can't wait. Mm. Yeah, they are, and they're they're all starting to build their own internal teams around this. And I think that talent absolutely is the throttle on pretty much everything that happens here. Not just talent in the service design space, but just talent generally. You mm. know, someone asked me the other day, "When will design thinking take off in this part of the world?" And I said, "Well." Look, I'll settle for thinking taking off in this part of the world before we worry about design thinking, because there's still we literally do have that far to go in a lot of cases. So it's it's going to be a real challenge, I think, to kind of get there. But yeah, I think the competitive dynamic here is just going to open it up so much more quickly. Yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of the the talent in this uh, in this part of the world, um, what what they what people tend to look for, like the people who are in working in our field, is People who are brought up here and then may have gone and got, say, their education and university degree somewhere else. They might have gone to Canada or Australia or the US, and then uh, come come back to Hong Kong and uh, and they've kind of then got that sort of different perspective yeah. and and it's a it's a more I don't know it's a worldly more worldly view. They've got that critical thinking layer. They've They've kind of that. They're the ones that are sort of highly prized as, as practitioners here. So um, I think that that's only going to continue. And um, yeah, yeah. And I think there's another interesting phenomenon here that I've noticed about, and this is to the point about how different it is here as well. It's 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 difficult to explain how different it is, but also how different the differences are between all of the different cultures and, and countries here. And I see it play out a lot in the language and the thinking that we use around organizations. I think that we forget a lot of the time that an organization and a corporation as a, as a structure, it has a very particular cultural root. It came right. from Europe, yeah. effectively. And so in, I think in Europe and the US and Australia, you kind of see a very neat match between the social values and the, the sort of public spaces and the intellectual spaces that we have in an organization. And so you tend to see that the, the narrative is a lot more about ideas and things are driven by this conversation around ideas and values. Whereas you come here, I think that, you know, the organizations typically, the, the first interactions they've had with a lot of countries in this part of the world have been, you know, in that sort of colonial period. And they were typically quite violent and quite negative. And so you don't have a very neat overlap between the shared sort of cultural values that people have and the places they go to work at and the way that they're required to work in those places too. So I think if anything, that, that slows it down slightly, but it also makes a bigger case for designing organizations as a whole. And I mean, what I was just thinking is um, we're talking about service design in Asia, but it's the same like talking about service design in Europe. Uh, for me, yes. service design in, in Scandinavia is already different than service design in the Netherlands. So. I can imagine that there are huge differences in Asia too, right? Mm, yeah. That's absolutely right. I yeah. mean, for me, I, I look at, we've done a lot of stuff in the Philippines and I think the Philippines is, you're going to see some of the best designers in the 21st century mm. come out of the Philippines because I feel like they have such an incredibly just natural talent for empathy. People there are just seem to be, you know, 
unbelievably interested in what each other are doing, very willing and able to put themselves in each other's shoes, very high natural level of emotional intelligence. And so the work that we've done, when we do it in the Philippines, we find it takes off so much quicker as opposed to somewhere like mainland China, which has its own pluses and minuses, but they're very, very different pluses and minuses. Absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing just how much of a difference just a positive mindset can actually make to our kind of work. As you probably know, like we've seen different audiences or different people that we work with across the region. And like we call out the Philippines because they, you know, it's just such a positive experience all the time and it's like yeah. they're, they're really hungry for it and they really embracing of it and very positive. They're just assuming that what what it's going to do is good and whereas you don't, you don't have to spend as much time convincing people that this stuff works. Uh, they will kind of give you that benefit and, and sort right. of let, yeah. let, it, let it go more. So uh, whereas other, other countries you might have to spend a lot of time you know, uh, getting the facts, uh, convincing people, um, you know, just building the, the case to even try this in the first place. So, and that's kind of, that's kind of a little bit, it's a, it's quite difficult. I find that personally quite difficult to do because, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd rather spend my time trying something and doing it rather than convincing or, you know, trying to get to that point where we're actually going to do something. Well, yeah. it, it, it will be leading by example, I guess, if some countries uh, can show that this works and what what the impact is, uh, hopefully others will follow, right? It's um, Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, we have more to talk about. So uh, I guess if people want to know more about this topic, just go to the conference. All right. Absolutely. And I'll just, I just want to say about the conference, um, we, we have actually spent a lot of time getting really good case studies from different places around the region. So we've actually got stuff from, you know, uh, Taiwan, um, Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong locally, Philippines. So we are looking to give that variety and the, like the diverse perspectives is something I think people would find really quite interesting to no, see how this yeah. stuff plays out in these different uh, countries. And I think that that in itself is quite fascinating. Okay, guys, we're moving uh, on to the second topic. And it's one that hasn't been on uh, any of the previous episodes. I'm uh, really curious uh, what you make of this. And it's uh, about uh, artificial intelligence services. What is a question yeah. starter that goes along with this one? Okay, well, I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take the asking of the question because this is uh, Kristen's particular interest. So <laughs> I will ask the question. Uh, I will ask when when will uh, artificially intelligent services uh, become quite well known? When will people know what they mean? Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, uh, I I guess the short answer to that would be sooner than everyone thinks. Uh, but I'll preface that by explaining what I mean by the term artificially intelligent services first. Uh, one of the things I noticed that one of the things that, that got me into service design and also starting to stitch a really close relationship between service design and user experience design was I'd noticed that pretty much every touch point that we're working with when we do service design is either being touched by digital or just being outright consumed by it. And I've seen this happen more and more and more. And I think we're at the point now where you're seeing this trend from you know, product-based economies shifting to being service-based economies. And then once you're a service-based economy, you start being consumed by software, as Mark Andreessen puts it. And that consumption of all of these different touch points by software, that's kind of creating this structure, I think, which can now be consumed by artificial intelligence a little bit more. And so what I've seen in my own practice here in this part of the world is that we're getting a lot more, uh, a lot more examples of this popping up now where we're seeing different different levels, different sorts of artificial intelligent products start to interface with service experiences and the effect Could of you give it is... Could an example? Because of yeah, absolutely. totally, totally. So, uh, you know, in, in Manila, I'm no stranger to the call centers there. I get to visit them a lot. And 
And just, just as a sidebar, if you've ever uh, spoken to someone in a call center and they're from the Philippines, I can tell you what it's like there. They're, you know, extremely friendly people, very smart at what they do. Uh, typically when they're calling, when you're, when they're speaking to you on the phone, they're managing about 12 to 18 different interfaces on this, on this tool that they're using while they talk to you while they sound interested and concerned about what you're talking about to them. So they, they're good at their jobs. Um, but at the same time, you know, that's not always an ideal experience when you have to call up a call center and interact with a human being. It, you know, sometimes they're not helpful. Sometimes the systems don't support them. What we're seeing now actually is literally there's been examples of software intervening in this process now and starting we're having artificially intelligent agents start to represent themselves either through voice or text as intermediaries for a company. And they're taking over some of that customer interaction. And in doing so, they're actually proving to be quite good at it as well. So when you have an AI that sits behind a call center that might normally take 5,000 calls a day or something like that, uh, it knows every single one of those calls. It was on every single one of those calls. It's reflecting and learning about what went right, what right. didn't go right yeah. each of yeah. those calls. And so it tends to get a lot better, a lot quicker than any of the human counterparts that sit behind it. Um, and you know, in the long term, I think that's a, that's a really dangerous thing because when you look uh, well, at what is the long term because uh, it could be uh, quicker than we think right like you said yeah i think so I, I see this i see this stuff having a major economic impact uh you know within as little as 10 years absolutely we're already seeing it now in the philippines and i think the philippines is kind of a a really good case study in what's going to happen to every single country in the world because this isn't just about smart people, silly people, it's not that. It's it's literally every single task that we do as jobs is being beginning to be consumed by this stuff. And the Philippines just happens to be in the unfortunate place of having most of its economy being driven by tasks that are actually really easily uh, automated. You know, whether it's work right. overseas, outside of the Philippines, doing work that's going to be automated in another country or BPO workers inside of Manila who are, you know, doing a lot of work there, that's going to get uh, automated and removed as well. They're going to get really just crucified economically because of this stuff. And that that's the future that's pretty much coming for all of us. And I think we need to design our way out of it sooner rather than later because it's it's coming, definitely. And, and um, th this topic hasn't come up on the show, and I guess that's for a reason, do you think? Uh, HR is more open to this, or is there more need for this? Or I, would... I think this is this is there's a couple of reasons. I think one, so open is a, is a good uh, word that you use there. I, I find that um, the constraints, the complexity, and the appetite and the competition that you find here in this part of the world really drives some very nuanced and advanced usage of technology generally. Um, so you know your average your average consumer, let's call them in China, is is probably one of the most advanced digital you know, users in the world, they pretty much interact with all sorts of different technology. The firewall means that everyone has to have quite a high baseline level of knowing how technology works because we're all trying to get in and out of it all of the time. Um, so that does drive a lot of the interest in this sort of stuff. But also things like, you know, messaging applications and people being able to do more and more with them. So WeChat is a good example of this. WeChat as a tool is the Swiss army knife of living in China. You know, mm. even as a foreigner, you can get by in China just with WeChat. Even if you can't speak a word of Chinese, it will do everything for you. So you're seeing all of these different touch points start to get aggregated into single sort of interactions that people can can interface with. And maybe right now it looks like a messaging app, but it won't be like that necessarily in the mm. future. It can be like all sorts of interactions. So I think the other thing as well is we've got you know a really interesting scene here locally, at least in Hong Kong, for robotics and artificial intelligence as well. We have some of the, the world's leading thinkers on it, um, which is great. And that kind of drives a lot of the progress here for that as well. So, so where do you get your inspiration uh, around this topic? That's a very good question. <laughs> I think, yeah. uh, for me, I, I get I get inspiration around this topic because, like Kristen said, there's some of the best brains in the world uh, right here in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong, in many ways, is like a small town, uh, even though it's a it's a huge <laughs> city. It's it, these people are kind of accessible, so you can you can meet them, you can talk to them about what they're doing. They're they're kind of like I don't I just don't feel like I would have had access to these sorts of people if uh, I was still in Australia, for example. Um, it's just that there is sort of a lot of uh, I don't know I guess access to to the to the people to talk to directly about it and and hear from them what they're trying yeah, to achieve. Yeah. So yeah. there is more of a community on this topic. 
I think there is. I I, think so. yeah, yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of interest in it. There's a lot of uh, people who will go uh, and yeah, and, and meet and talk about it in person. Uh, and I think that's yeah, that's there's a bit of a culture of like workshopping this sort of stuff here as well. Yeah. Mm. All right. Artificial intelligence services. I hope we uh, we hear more of this because it's really interesting. It hasn't popped up a lot in the service design community yet. Yeah, I think you will. Yeah, I'd expect it to. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, we've got uh, one more topic left, and uh, I guess uh, this one uh, will be uh, yours to answer, Patty. But uh, Kristen, you have yeah. to come up with a question that goes along with the lack of urgency. Okay. So uh, the one I'm going to ask is this one, Patty. How much? How much lack of urgency is there around service design? Well, okay. So that. That question, um, that topic was specifically for here in Hong Kong and the region uh, because there is a, a more of a lack of urgency around uh, this uh, service design and design thinking, what we do. So my, um, I guess my one of my frustrations has been that uh, that lack of urgency. So, for example, large corporates, uh, we've had several um, engagements where, or potential engagements where it's just hasn't been urgent or necessary to take action or they haven't felt the, the need that they need to take action on this stuff. So when we're talking about artificially intelligent services, that to me should be a sort of I don't know, a case for taking some sort of action, some sort of experimentation perhaps, some sort of like, you know, let's see what this can do for our business, what is the opportunity here. But I don't I don't see a lot of that happening. And and I, I think, uh, yeah, for me, that's one of the major frustrations in the region. I, I, I think people are maybe just a bit more risk averse here or maybe they don't think it's going to happen as fast as it's going to happen. Um, but whatever the reason is, uh, that's why, in fact, uh, we have decided to give the conference that we're holding later right. in this year uh, the theme of urgency. Yeah. So, so could this uh, have something to do with the perspective on customers in general uh, compared to the rest of the world? Yeah, I think so. I, I think to the point earlier as well about you know organisations and the and the, the the heritage of organisations as a concept and and what that means differently here. That yeah, you know, when you when you take a structure like that and you put it in a in what is probably normally quite a hierarchical culture, that you find that customers tend to fall pretty low on that pyramid. And so you know, yeah, it's hard everywhere to sell service design. We all know that it's hard to do it everywhere. Definitely. Uh, it feels harder here because even mentioning, even even admitting that the customer exists seems like a heresy in a lot of situations. Um, it's it's like they are, they just don't exist on anyone's radar. And so why would we design for them? Why would we even serve them? Why would we sell to them? Why would we do anything for them? Because they don't they don't exist. And, an, and a, re a good recent example, actually, of that was uh, Hong Kong government recently had a problem with their, their bins. So the current bins are sort of these round cylinder, orange cylinders, and they've got quite a large uh, opening on either side for the rubbish. And, uh, and, and it was noticed that there was still, despite this fact, there was still rubbish piling up on the outside of these bins. There's a lot of, you know, just crap everywhere on the streets around these bins. So uh, the Hong Kong government has decided uh, just without any research or without any analysis or uh, any um, just insight, I guess, uh, into the problem that they were trying to solve. Uh, they've just redesigned the bins to have a, a, a smaller opening. And the rationale for that is to, to get people to be more targeted in putting their rubbish in. Well, aim better in. when the hole is smaller. All right. Okay. And uh, what happened? <laughs> and of course, there's been a, a, a rather big uh, backlash from uh, from that. Uh, a lot of people in from our community here in Hong Kong are saying, "Well, see, look, this is this is a, a, a prime example about why we should be pa paying attention to this stuff, why we should be more human centered, why we should ex acknowledge that users and customers exist." But not only that also get to the, the core of the problem. I, I don't think the problem what we're trying to solve <laughs> there is is people's ability to get exactly. rubbish yeah, and finish. Yeah. 
I feel like there's another, there's another whole layer so, yeah, of problems. Yeah, you need these kind of case studies, not the ones that succeeded, but the ones that failed, right? Yeah, well, we do need, oh, yeah. yeah, we do need more of, in a way, we need more of that. But uh, in another way, the culture here is quite different in there. There is a fear of, of, of taking these sorts of experiments and uh, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't, we don't really have that culture of experimentation that we, we need. Yeah. Uh, so I think we've got a, a ways to go before we, uh, before we can kind of like crack the, the, the code on that one, I think. Well, I mean, you, you kind of see that as the, to the relationship between government and innovation. There was a good example again uh, recently here with Tesla. So there's a lot of Teslas in Hong Kong. The regulation's typically pretty favorable for them. But one of the departments in the Hong Kong government recently decided that Tesla had to remove the calendar app from the software. Had to. Had to remove the calendar app, otherwise you can't drive your Tesla here. The reason that they gave was that they determined that there was no immediate reason that you need a calendar app in a car. And so then, of course, it needs to be removed. That what they've missed there, I think, is the probably fairly obvious point that going from A to B usually is very closely tied to where you're going and when you need to be there, all of which is tied to a calendar. But you kind of have to go through these sorts of discussion points and you will have very uh, authentic Hong Kong experiences when you, when you interact with the government and you sort of routinely ask to do the impossible or forego the obvious for those that, sorts of that said, uh, we sound like we're bagging the government a bit <laughs> here, um, but that said, we do actually have some, uh, we're speaking to some departments in yeah, the Hong Kong government and they are, they do actually, they're talking a lot about service design, to be honest. They are, yeah. uh, there's a new department called the Innovation Technology Bureau and their uh, remit is to just basically bust open some of these silos and start introducing um, service design and design thinking across the government and uh, sort of stop some of these sort of waste of money uh, kind of activities that are going on. Yeah. So there, there's progress, but it's, it's you know, there's a lot of stop, start sort of stuff oh, that goes it's, on. It's, it's, it's still in the early pioneering stage. That's what I'm getting sorry. back from you. Yeah, yeah. I Definitely. think uh, just in comparison, like, you know, we're both from Australia and, and I would say coming here was a little bit of a shock because we thought, you know, just where, where you come from, you just think the rest of the world is exactly the same in its maturity of, of a practice. And, and we were quite shocked at uh, even a user experience design was not so well known. And, and to me, that's been around forever. So right. Um, right. here it's still like, oh, user experience design, what's that? <laughs> so you kind of, and let alone something more abstract like, service design, uh, you, you sort of have this way of talking about it. You start with service design and then you gradually go down to, uh, I make websites. I have a question related, uh, I guess, to what you're saying. And it's uh, uh, the question I'm asking everyone in the show. And that is, if people are, approach you with a question of, um, you know, I want to get into service design. Do you have a tip? Where should I start? Or what, what is your most valuable tip for people that want to get into service design? Mm. Mm. Um, well, for me, I think it's um, it's especially in, in parts of the world like this where the it's it's really not like a mature sort of uh, baseline for everyone to play to. I think you have to get really comfortable making a market for yourself, and and by that I mean you have to. You have to almost use language as a design tool. So don't don't obsess over what is user experience, what is service design, what's the difference, how do I know what the difference is. Don't worry about putting silos and boundaries around things. There is endless opportunities to do service design work. Hong Kong is a great example. We don't make anything here. We don't mine anything here. Literally every single dollar that circulates in the economy is coming from services. So anything you're doing, even remotely close to this space, is going to involve some aspect of service design. Whether or not you can get someone to understand that service design is a thing and that it needs to be done is almost beside the point. You can tailor the language that you're using, talk in the language about what they value, and then just do the design anyway and you can still create a really good opportunity for yourself. Yeah, we had, we had a, a social mixer. We had service design drinks uh, a couple of nights ago, actually, mm. and we've been really growing the community. We had about uh, almost 100 people turn up, I think around about 100 people, yeah. um, and that compared to when we started that community four years ago is like, that was just basically you and me. Like, <laughs> service design drinks, stink. <laughs> 
so so yeah. uh, your tip, Patty, would be to I get involved get, uh, in the community. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I get asked that a lot of question, uh, uh, that question a lot at these social mixes now, and and my tip is to uh, take what you know. So, for example, people know user experience design now, and I say, you know, start there. Start just, you know, do do a course, do a, you know, there's lots, plenty of courses around. Um, just te you can teach yourself or do a formal course. User experience design is a great place to start. Go into an internal team, get a mentor, just learn some of these basic human-centered design practices, methodologies, processes, mindset, and then keep coming to these events because this community now is over 2,000 strong. It, it, we're all talking about how to advance the practice, how to get people to understand what we do. We're always talking and evolving the language around it. So it's a combination of things. It's like, yep, yeah, you have to have a job, so start somewhere yeah, like you yeah. Start, start yeah. in an established field and then slowly infiltrate yeah. service then, design yeah. in there. Now, awesome. Uh, guys, this is uh, your opportunity to ask the people who are watching or listening to this episode the question. What would you like to ask them? Okay. When are you coming? Come over. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we want service designers here. Yeah, yeah. We, we really want them. So when are you coming? And please make the answer soon. Yes. <laughs> I, I would absolutely second that. Anyone coming through Hong Kong, even just a one day, two day stopover, I would say give me and Kristen a call. Uh, we're always happy to meet new service designers. We always will, we will try and probably convince you to stay here or move here because uh, we want we we want to just build uh, the on the momentum that's happening. We know the demand is going to be here soon, and we we already know there's a whole bunch of people uh, for the from the rest of the world who are fascinated, just as fascinated as we are with this region. And uh, yeah, so yeah. it's yeah, definitely come visit us. Um, and that wasn't a question, but yeah. <laughs> Why haven't you contacted you already? Uh, I'm curious what people will answer. Uh, uh, there was an awesome interview with two people uh, that I haven't done before, so uh, I, I think it really worked out. Yeah, the, uh, a digital high five from you too. Uh, thank you for your time, guys, and giving us uh, an insight into what's happening in Asia. And I hope we'll be hearing a lot, a lot more about that. Great. No worries, no, Mark. So too. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. So, what are your thoughts about the topics we've just discussed with Patty and Kristen? Uh, do you think artificial intelligence services will take over? Let us know down below in the comments. With the Service Design Show, we help you to stay one step ahead by talking to the people that are shaping the service design field. If you enjoyed this episode and like to see more interviews with service design pioneers, subscribe to the channel and check out some of the past episodes. For now, thanks for watching and see you next time.